Hi, everybody. It's Todd over at SciSoft. Thanks for tuning in. So has this ever happened to you? You're running some SERTI simulations, and you've got a transmitter, and you're trying a bunch of different transmit equalization settings, maybe different, uh, different de-emphasis settings. And you've got a bunch of channel models. Uh, in this case, we're just going to take a simple channel and change the length. And you run these combination of channels and equalization settings. And obviously, you can go plot eye diagrams. But another really good way to look at equalization is to plot equalized pulse responses and figure out whether or not your equalization is actually containing the energy in the pulse response to one UI or how closely it's doing that. And so you go off and you plot the family of equalized pulse responses, and you get this crazy looking plot where you've got all these different DC levels, and you've got all these pulses happening at different points in time. And you're wondering, like, gee, did I just invent PAM5, or what's going on here? Um, so in this video, what we want to do is we actually want to dig into the physics behind this, talk about why this actually is the correct pulse response plot for this uh, scenario. But more importantly, look at other ways that you can present this data that will make it easier to figure out what your equalization is or isn't doing for you. So let's dig in and take a closer look. Let's start out by making this problem as simple as we can by looking at the behavior of this network using Ohm's law. And by the way, while I'm at it, um, what was Ohm's full name? How many of you remember that it was George Simon Ohm? And if you didn't remember that, don't feel bad. I just looked it up on Wikipedia. What I want to do here is take a ideal Surtees transmitter, an ideal channel, and an ideal receiver, and I want to figure out what the voltages in this network are expected to be in the absence of equalization. Now we're going to make this really simple. We're going to make our transmitter uh, two independent single-ended outputs. Each one has a 1-volt power supply. It has a 50-ohm output. It has no capacitance. Um, our channel model is literally ideal. It's 1, one milliohm, so we can consider it 0. And then our receiver is the same thing. It's two independent single-ended inputs. Each one is 50 ohms to ground. And what we want to do is we want to use Ohm's law to look at the voltages and currents in this network and figure out where things are going to go be. Uh, now, basically, Ohm's law is going to tell us with a 1-volt uh, supply and a 50-ohm driver and a 50-ohm termination, we're going to divide half of our voltage at the output and the other half of our voltage at the receiver. And so if we were looking at the either one of these signals in the one state, we'd see half a volt. If we looked at either one of these signals in the zero state, we expect to see zero because we're just driving ground to ground. Differentially, if we look at the receiver, because it's a differential signal that we're dealing with in IVIS AMI, when we have uh, half a volt here and zero volts here, we expect to see a differential voltage of half a volt. And when we have a zero here and uh, 0.5 here, we're going to actually see negative half a volt. So what we expect to see in this network is a signal with a one volt peak to peak amplitude swinging around zero volts plus or minus half a volt. If we want the simulation and we look at the step response, that's exactly what we see. Here's our, uh, our zero value differentially. Here's our one value. Uh, in fact, if I, if I come in here and I put a marker down, you can see that it's basically exactly half a volt plus or minus. There's a little bit of an edge rate here just because uh, I gave the signal a little bit of a slope. It makes it easier to look at. If I look at the pulse response for this network, same thing. It turns out that that edge rate gives us just a little bit of band limiting. So we've got these, uh, these bobbles at the top and bottom. But basically, what we're able to do is look at the simulation result and correlate it exactly back to what we expected from hand analysis. So now let's make this more interesting by using a more realistic channel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those resistors I had a minute ago, and I'm going to replace them with a piece of transmission line. This is just going to be stock 100 ohm differential FR4 transmission line. I'm going to start with a length of 1 1,000th of an inch, so that's basically the ideal case that I just had. And then I'm going to sweep the length in increments of 5 inches until I get to 20 inches. And if we run an analysis and we look at the step responses, here's the ideal step response we had just a minute ago. And then as I increase the length of the line, I see that uh, the step response takes longer to reach the far end of the line, and I'm getting more and more of a roll-off the longer I make that line. Basically. I expect the roll-off because I know that the high-frequency energy is getting attenuated more than the low-frequency energy, and it takes longer for this transition to complete. 
As a matter of fact, if I turn around and look at this in the frequency domain and I plot the insertion loss, I can see that the longer I make the line, the more high frequency roll off I get, which is what I would expect. If I look at my pulse responses, here's the ideal pulse response or ideal case we had a minute ago. The longer I make this line, the lower the pulse height gets and the longer it takes the pulse to settle down. So the energy is actually getting spread across more bit times. As a matter of fact, if I was to superimpose the step response on the pulse response, what we can see here is that the two track each other exactly up to some point, and then the pulse response returns to zero because what's happening in the pulse response case is I'm only sending one bit time worth of high energy down the line, and in effect, it just never gets the chance to finish switching high before it has to turn around and switch low. Now, if I look over here at the beginning of the pulse responses, there's an interesting effect here, and that is that we can see these pulse responses look like they're starting at different DC levels. In fact, if I zoom in, um, what I can see more clearly here is that there's a definite shift in the zero level with length associated with these pulse responses. And my very short channel, my near ideal case, is starting right at about half a volt below ground that we just computed a minute ago. But if I look at my longest case, which is 20 inches, that is actually at about 475, 474 and high numbers, uh, millivolts before, below ground. So as I make the line longer, the starting voltage for my differential pulse response is actually shifting up. And what's causing that? And to do that or to figure that one out, we're going to go back and take another look at Ohm's law. So where's that 475 millivolts coming from? Well, let's push into the etch here and take a look at its electrical characteristics. And if I bring it up into the editor, what we see, everything in white is what we entered. So that would be the physical and material properties. And over here we have the characteristics that the simulator has predicted. And in particular, what we're seeing is a DC loss component of 261 milliohms per inch. So let's remember, that's a 20-inch line. So if I take 261 milliohms and I multiply it by 20 inches, that's going to give me 5.2 ohms of loss in that line from start to end. So this is the DC resistance of that line. Now, Ohm's law is going to tell me that in any system, I'm going to drop some of my voltage across each piece of resistance. So I'm dropping some of my voltage across the transmitter, some across the line, and then I'm dropping the remaining voltage across the receiver. In this case, the amount of voltage I'm dropping across the receiver is the termination impedance, which is 50 ohms, over the total impedance of the system times the source voltage. So in this particular case, that ends up being 50 ohms divided by the total impedance, which is 50 plus 50 plus 5.22, and that's going to give me 475 millivolts at the receiver, which is exactly what we just saw. So that's where it's coming from. So there's one more piece to this puzzle, and that's how transmitter equalization is affecting the waveform. And so for this set of experiments, I went back to my very short channel, basically ideal, and I'm sweeping the coefficients on the transmitter equalization. And I've got five sets of numbers here, as you can see, and I calculated them by pulling a app note down off the SciSoft website that allows me to calculate the tap coefficients for different levels of post cursor de-emphasis. And I solve these equations for 1 and a half, 3, 4 and a half, and 6 dB of de-emphasis, and I got the coefficients that you see here. So there are five experiments, no equalization at all, 1 and a half, 3, 4 and a half, and 6 dB down. Now just uh, for sake of memory, let's just remember the minus 3 dB setting is about uh, 150 millivolts uh, off on the post cursor tap. Just we'll, we're going to bring that back in a minute. And when I run those experiments and I plot the pulse responses, this is what I get. So again, the red is my unequalized case, and I'm plus or minus half a volt. And as I turn my post cursor tap up, I'm getting more and more depression of these um, subsequent one levels. Basically, the way emphasis works is I emphasize the first bit after a transition, and then I de-emphasize the succeeding bits. And the more I crank up the de-emphasis, the lower this level goes. Now, the rising edge is only telling half the story. So let's look at the pulse response. And what I did here is I plotted slow pulses, four ones followed by four zeros. So we can see the emphasis 
and we can see the de-emphasis for both the rising and falling edges. And again, if we look here in the unequalized case, I've got basically plus and minus half a volt. We can see that as we increase the de-emphasis, the steady state one and steady state zero levels are getting closer together. So I'm paying for transmitter equalization with I margin because my I in the steady state case is actually closing in. Um, there's, no, there's no free lunch here. If we're going to use transmit equalization, we're going to lose I height. Um, we'll notice that all of these things are always peaking at the same voltage because we have one basic physical limitation, which is we only have so much voltage in the power supply. So we can peak at plus or minus half a volt, but we're going to have to pull back depending on how much we're de-emphasizing. Now, here is my case where I have my uh, 3 dB down. And so I want to go measure that, because remember that was about 150 millivolts off the cursor. And if I look here, here my peak to peak has been reduced by twice that. So I had 150 millivolts times two, 300 millivolts, take that away from one volt peak to peak. I've got 700 millivolts worth of eye height in that case. There's no free lunch. Now another way of looking at this is in the frequency domain. And that is that if I look at the um, transfer function of the output, basically here's my unequalized case. It's flat um, pretty much. There's a little bit of roll off because I, I had an edge rate on this thing. But the more that I increase the de-emphasis, the more that I get a de-emphasis at low frequency. And that's what transmitter equalization is doing. It's trying to compensate for the fact that high frequency energy is de-emphasized or it's lost in the network. And so in order to get level out the response from end to end in the network, what we basically do is we depress the low frequencies at the transmitter so that by the time the channel gets done depressing the high frequencies, we get a flatter response band from transmitter to receiver through the channel. So now we've come full circle. In our original simulation setup, we had a channel with three different sets of length and five sets of equalization coefficients. When we looked at those pulse responses, you'll remember we had three independent clear sets of variation due to length. We can see now the minor variation due to the DC loss of the network and the much larger variation due to transmitter equalization. And so what this is showing us is that this plot is actually correct. This is the behavior that we should be expecting in a differential system at the receiver input. Now that's helpful, but it doesn't help me compare how the different equalization schemes are working. And so to do that, I'm going to use a different kind of a view where I'm going to tell the tool to normalize the pulse responses and align them. Now, this isn't how the physical system behaves, but it's very useful from the standpoint of understanding equalization because now what we've done is we've taken all these pulse responses and we've aligned them in time and voltage. To align them in time, we've used the algorithm we call the hula hoop algorithm to predict where the recovered clock will be sampling the data. We've shifted all of the pulse responses so that that's at zero time, and we've shifted them all on the y-axis so that they all start and end at zero volts, and then we've set the y-axis to basically UI, unit intervals at the simulation data rate, and so now at uh, one UI before the cursor, or one after, or two, or three, I can come and see how much voltage I'm going to be uh, in getting as ISI that's going to ultimately be impinging on my I margin. So that's an interesting way of looking at these responses. It's very helpful for figuring out what equalization is or isn't buying me, and we'll be looking at that in more depth in a subsequent video. But for now, thanks for watching. I hope you found this helpful.